Okay, we're going to do a review for the Modern Optics Exam 2. First thing you want to do is go to the syllabus and see what letters the exam will be on. So we're here October 13th, exam 2, H to N. So that's what we're going to look at, H to N. So let's do that. So let's look at uh, H first. For H, notice that more lenses are needed more than one to correct for aberrations. You got the diaphragm in the middle. Then you got an achromatic doublet here to the right. For the close-up photography, I would say you want to know how to do these problems. You know your definition, your magnification is minus SI over SO, and the basic formula, 1 over SO plus 1 over SI is 1 over F. And here, I was doing the ray tracing, parallel ray goes through F, one goes through the center, undeviated. For here, uh, yeah, this formula, yeah, you should know that if you had the lenses close to each other, these are diopters they add. I would say this formula on the right with the D, we'd go ahead and give you that. So you wouldn't worry about that, but you should know this one. This is just simply saying the diopters add when the two lenses are slapped together with no distance between them. Definition of diopters, you want to know that. And here's uh, three versions so that you can easily convert. So you definitely want to know this stuff. Uh, that's on that's on this page here. This is all good stuff. Yeah, you want to know, know all of that. Then here, we, yeah, here's that formula I was telling you about. You definitely want to know that. That's your basic formula. And to know how to do a problem like this is good. Yeah, this is good. And when you have the diopter, you attach these lenses. You want to be able to know how to do the, the lens attachments and the barrels. And this is your basic formula that you had. And... Here, you probably should at least know that the play in the camera is not much. There's not much play here. You don't need to remember it's like 10 millimeters, but you should know standard lens, 50 millimeters. That's always good to know for this is a single lens reflex camera, 50. And there's just a little bit of play back there. It's 10 millimeters. Okay, so I think we're going to look at all that. The telephoto lens here, this... This relative magnification thing is nice to know. That means if you have the case where you have 50 millimeters, that's considered that's considered standard. And then the relative magnification, you you divide you know 50 into into f to give you like the relative. So like 50 millimeters is standard, and that's considered like the, the base, the one you compare with that. So if you have 100 millimeters, that's two times magnification compared to the normal lens because 50 goes into 100 two times. Uh, this is the general idea of the telephoto design. You should know that general principle and this diagram really does a nice job in showing you intuitively why the camera thinks the one bend took place back here and that the effective focal length is much larger. So it's good to look at a problem like this, but I wouldn't memorize these formulas. Like these would be given to you. Uh, we would give you this, the backward focal length. We don't expect you to memorize that. And the effective focal length with the D in there, we would give that to you. Now, that said, then you should know how to do a problem like this. So it's good to go over this problem. This is a good problem. Very nice. 
wide angle lens, you want to know that the wide angle has a short focal length and the narrow uh, angle of view has a long focal length, which you can see very easily by sketching this. This is very easy to sketch. Just put a film and a lens and go backwards from the edge through the center and you could easily check out that res result. Here's a ridiculously uh, wide angle, very wide angle, super wide angle shot of the Biltmore House. So for the uh, problem with the wide angle, you can have a short focal length where the lens would be too close, where you have a mirror in here, you have a mechanism. So this design that puts the converging lens uh, in the middle and puts the diverging lens left, you would go up and then like this, and the camera thinks it, can, it bent right here, but really you don't have anything there. You have, well, you have a mirror that's going to flip up. So that's good to do also. Once again, we would give you these formulas, but you could plug in numbers and play around and do some engineering work. With the zoom lens, let me think about this before I commit. Let's see, if we gave you these two things as we did before, the backward focal length and this, I'd have to think about this. I mean, if we give you this and you're just plugging in numbers, I just have to check to make sure that it doesn't take that long to do. So I would say no, I would say no the process. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't thought about this in that much detail, but if I can figure out numbers that come out easy and it won't take you that long, I would say yes, we should, prob we should include this, this kind of an analysis, because you're starting from the same given principles and you're playing with the, with the numbers. So let's, let's, let's keep that. And there is the tiger. Okay, so let's now go to eye and see for eyeglasses. You need not worry about the details of this eye, but you should know that the optics part, that you have a cornea and you have a crystalline lens, you have an eye lens. And when this gets more bulgy, you can look at things close up. And when this is thinner, uh, you look far away. So that's the, how you control the dioptric power here. Uh, these muscles push in, you get the bulge. The ciliary muscles pull back, you get the stretch. So at least the optical system there is important to know about. Then here, this is just a little analogy with the eye. That's nice to go over that. Just keep your uh, frame of framework. And here, let's see. Yes, I already mentioned this. I already mentioned this idea about the crystalline lens. And here we're combining into one effective lens. For the dioptric power of the eye, well, let's see. It's not a bad thing to know that the focal length of the eye is about 16 millimeters. And then when you work with that, you get your 64 diopters. The eye basically goes from 60 to 64 uh, for a person just passing the test of, you know, accommodation, being able to see close and far. Uh, your F number definition appears again here, so it's nice to always remember your F number. Uh, I'd remember this as D equals F slash number. You know, that's an easy way to remember that. I would say we can skip over all this stuff. This is biology background. We don't need that. Uh, for the eye chart, it's nice to know that if you can read the 20 uh, A line at B feet to know how to figure out, in fact, it tells you here, it's, I would go over this. Uh, if you read the 20 A line at B feet, like what's your vision? And they definitely know that. So go ahead and review that. Here we can skip the baseball stuff. And here, you know, this is optics. So it's probably good to know this, that if, if the ciliary muscles here relax and pull back, this, uh, the ligaments stretch, become taut, and then this is flatter and you have less diopters. And then if you want to see something close up, the uh, ciliary muscles push in these get loose and you get more of a bulge, you get more diopters. And that's your, that's your extra four diopters. So it's, it's nice to know that because that's really the optics part. 
than to prescribe glasses, know how to prescribe glasses for the myopic eye and the hyperopic eye. So do know that, prescribing glasses. So you do want to know how to do that. Prescribing glasses, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on this. So you do want to study that. Uh, this is the definition of diopters again, which you already have seen earlier. I would say this, um, you would not have to memorize this. This would be given to you. So if this is given to you, then you would plug in numbers. So I would this I would check to see how long it would take me to do, and probably here, if if I give you numbers and we're going to plug in and you can get done in ten minutes, then that's going to be good. Always be careful with the uh, the R's because often the R's are given as absolute magnitudes, and you have to decide you know, how to go plus or minus. And I showed you on one of the homework ones by just doing a little sketch and looking at the index of refraction, you can tell if it's going to bend toward the normal or away from the normal. And you can convince yourself based on the surrounding media as a guide to know that if you're putting in the right value. So this would be given to you because it has the D. See, this would be given to you, it has the D. And something like this would be given to you, and then you would plug in numbers. So just be careful with the, the curvature. Yeah, here's an example of what I'm talking about. If you're going from a index of refraction that's less, and this is this is going from a fast medium, light travels fast in there compared to the, this material. So then when you sketch your normal perpendicular to your little flat you know, surface locally there, you would bend toward the normal. So this is showing that this is a converging positive diopters. And then here, you're going from a, let's say, slow medium to a faster medium. So then when you put your normal in, you know, a little flat local region there, your normal, you're bending away from the normal. So that's, that's saying that this first surface is positive diopters and this one's negative. So you're going to pick the R so that it comes out that way to make sure that you're your power is making sense by the ray diagram. That's the simplest way to, to know what you're doing. Here's another case. You're going from here fast to slow, bend toward the normal. And here, since you're going from, let's say, uh, fa slower to fast, you bend away from the normal. So, so this is reinforcing that both of these surfaces are converging. They're positive you know, diopters. So I would say that's good. Principal planes, uh, don't worry about. Okay, so now we go on to the next one, which is the optical instruments. Okay, here we go. A pinhole camera here. Pinhole camera has infinite depth of field. That's good to know. And these are your angle of views. So this is reinforcing the previous chapter. It's like the same stuff we talked about. Uh, the eye, this is just saying that if the eye has a reflection from the cornea, it's white. And if it goes into the eye and hits the retina and comes back, it's red. And so that's the red eye and the corneal reflection from the convex uh, surface for the little white spot. For the magnifying glass, I... I think the process here to know that your magnification is based on this angle, you're, you're comparing you know, the angle alpha to the other angle. So I think that definition to understand that, and if you were presented with some diagrams, you could take some tangents. So it's good to read over that. And then here, the magnification formula is derived. It's, it's, it's a pretty short derivation, so I would kind of look at that just to review that. And then here, this is the problem we did for homework, the ophthalmoscopes. This is a repeat of uh, some physics, so that's good to, to know that. Half silvered mirror, nice diagram there. The projector, 
Well, see, this kind of a problem is very, very nice because it has the magnification appears again that we talked about and the big, you know, the basic formula here. So when you have these two, you can you can set this up and do a problem. This is very good. So yeah, definitely look at this. This is very short calculation. For the Fresnel lens, the concept is to not use the bulk glass, but have a, a thinner a thinner glass. And that's a nice idea to know about that. The Fresnel lens, see, there you go. And you could have uh, diverging or converging you know, pressed out, see little concentric uh, little circles there. The overhead projector has a Fresnel lens there. So, you know, it's probably nice to read this because this is, this is good for like a GRE type question where they ask a question, do you, do you, uh, you know, do you pull back the focus? I, yeah, I would read this. I, I would look this over. This is kind of nice to, to look it over. For the microscope, the basic idea is two magnifications, a uh, real image magnification, and then a uh, virtual image magnification. That's the general idea. You have objective and you have eyepiece. Or this is also called the ocular. And this uh, kind of a problem has your basic formulas in two steps. So you're basically doing the same thing twice. Here I'd have to look at this doesn't look, well, that doesn't look like that's not too bad. That's not too bad. So I, I would study this because that, that, that comes, when you put in some numbers, if you're not doing a general formula, that like the last uh, you know, exam had a general formula that takes longer, this, this doesn't when you plug in numbers. So I would say this is an excellent problem uh, to look at. Yes, very nice problem. For telescopes, uh, the general idea there is you have this cool formula. I would know this, the focal length of the, the long, the objective. And if you divide by the short focal length and stop on a minus sign, you get the magnification. So that's kind of good to know that formula. Here, I don't think these proofs, no, the proofs are not necessary. I would just know the formula. And notice that when you put the... Uh, the distance you add the focal lengths so here since that's a negative when you add the distances you're going to take the f1 add a negative f2 and see it's going to be shorter distance so you do want to know that principle here you take the f1 which is positive and the f2 which is positive add them together and you get then the longer distance so two things remember you add the focal lengths to place the two elements, optical elements, and you then take the ratio with the minus sign, you know, the bigger one, you know it's got to be the bigger one because it's a telescope, the bigger one over the little one. So that's how you get a big number. Okay. All right, so I wouldn't worry about the proofs of these formulas. I would not worry about those. Okay, a nice scientific revolution. Let's see here. Concave mirror to form the real image, uh, the Newtonian telescope, to know that the concave mirror replaces, or is the objective. And then you have to have a cute little mirror to knock it out of, you know, to the side so you don't, your head doesn't block it in the way. Same formula. For the cast grain telescope, let's see what we got here. For the cast grain, Uh, this here, let's see. Okay, so this is one of those problems again, two steps where you're using the formula, you know, twice, and you have this D. So we did that the last exam. I, I would know this process to just go over this process because that process comes up, up a lot in our course. You use the first formula, and then you could have the S, you know, the D minus, the D minus, you know, the intermediate image, you know, position. So I would look this over and yeah, this is good to look over. Light gathering power, know that the area is, you have to square, you want the square, so the area you're doing, so the inch, it's just two inch mirror. And if that's an eight inch mirror, then this is four times the diameter, which was me, which would mean 16 times on the uh, light gathering power because that would the light gather it's how I say light gathering ability because of the area 
I would say here, you know, these are kind of cool for, you know, GRE type questions. So I would, I, I would get, know my way around this to, uh, to see what's going on here. We did have a homework problem that was related to, you know, bouncing things around where images are located. Okay, this little astronomy here, you don't need to know the astronomy details there. And the eclipse, pinhole camera, repeat there. And notice that the pinholes here are not really pinholes, they're pretty big holes. Uh, there's actually two holes. The, the ones that are forming the images are the ones, the smaller of, of the two. And there's Dr. Brotek showing the images and yeah here are the smaller ones the these smaller ones in there uh, the bigger ones and not giving you the effect here but the little one the smaller ones here are giving you the effect so no that's not really a pinhole size I remember my co-author Helena when she did pinhole camera with the groom she said that she in, in the evening she could have a fairly large uh, opening uh, the eclipses here uh, basic idea is a shadow shadow uh, this is the uh, this is the solar eclipse and this is the lunar eclipse uh, later we learned about the sky being blue blue light gets scattered and then what's left is red and a little bit of refraction bends it in and you have the blood red moon now we look at the sun and here's the damaged retina someone looked at the sun this is supposed to be a smooth area in the fovea right so it's nice to know about this. All right. Okay, and then here, solar eclipse. Yeah, I think I think we're finished with this chapter here. And then we go on to the aberrations, and the aberrations is kind of a break from mathematical detail because a lot of this stuff here is conceptual. You know, we should know how to expand your sine and your cosine, but this is conceptual to, to know these uh, spherical aberration coma. So this is, I would say like, no, like a one liner, like here, the one liner here would be marginal rays bend too much. That's spherical aberration. Got it. Like we got it. All right. This is for a spherical cut, which is cheaper to do. All right. Here, we don't need to really go into detail there. That's more of a cultural background for you. And then coma. Off-axis point is a little comma or a comet, a little flare. So you, see, you just have like a one-liner to know what each of these is. It's not mathematical. It's basically like a to know what they are. Curvature field, that a straight line vertical line curves the image is curved say so you know come up with your own definition the you know, own wording you know astigmatism that if you're looking at a point from above or from the side it focus at different places so that's not good uh, here I wouldn't worry about astigmatism for the eye. I wouldn't. I, this this nice to point this out, but that's not a major thing. This is on the aberrations, and then distortion. If you put the stop on the left, you get the barrel distortion. You put the stop on the right, you get the pin cushion, and then if you put it in the middle to cancel out. So, verbal descriptions: chromatic aberration, blue bends more than red. All right red bends less. And here is dispersion uh, showing that blue bends more, red bends, bends less. Here's your visible and the index of refraction is C more for the blue. So it's, it's a good break here. Now a little bit of math comes in here when you're doing the prism. And I would say here this is quite I think complicated for an exam. I, I think this derivation would not be, no, we would not have this derivation on the exam. So that's, that's, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about this. I would not worry about that. And this is very complicated to program, you know, that took me a while to do this. So 
I would say you're okay here with not not worry about that derivation and not worrying about no one memorizes this. So I would say here, let's agree that uh, I would give you this, the Abbey number, all right? It's the uh, yellow minus a one and then the blue minus the red. So let's agree, let's make a deal that you would be given that. All right, then for the achromatic doublet, beautiful hydrogen alpha line there, the red. Let's just show you the colors. Let's say here you would be given these things. You wouldn't have to memorize these things. You would memorize this. We already talked about that. You do want to know that one. So you would be given the Abbe number thing. And here, the rule, let's see, we're looking... Yeah, we're looking at this rule. I think we would just give you this. Let's, let's agree that these don't need to be memorized. That We could give you these, this principle. And then I'd have to think about some calculation that would be doable. So, you know, look it over. Look this over. So here, the achromatic doublet. Uh, this is a good problem and to know how to do. Notice the absolute value is kicking again, so you have to be careful with uh, checking your powers if they're positive or negative. We said we would give you something like this. You wouldn't have to memorize that. So here, you know, plugging in some numbers, and this doesn't look too bad, all right? And we said we would give you this formula. We remind you about this formula. So that's uh, very reasonable there to know about the doublet. For the gems, I think we can skip over this, this little geology here for your background. We can skip over the birthstones. And how does the eye correct for chromatic aberration? Well, that's, that's nice to know this. It helps review the uh, aberrations. For chromatic aberration, it's saying that the eye downplays the blue. Uh, eye lens absorbs uh, UV and blue, or the effect would be worse. And the eyes are, the cone's most sensitive in the yellow-green. Fovea has a deficiency of blue cones, and even the little pigment layer to absorb blue. I would say generally to know that the light is a, the optical part, definitely, that the, uh, the uh, eye lens absorbs uh, UV and blue, uh, some of the violet and blue, which then downplays the uh, chromatic aberration, and there's a deficiency of blue, so-called blue cones. Spherical aberration, you have your cornea is flatter at the edges, say spherical, since marginal rays bend too much, it counteracts that. And the index of refraction is less up there than compared to the center for your eye lens. So you got your cornea and your eye lens both contributing to this. So if you think of the cornea, it's aspherical, flatter at the edges. And the crystalline lens, it has less index of refraction at the edges so that it counteracts this effect. This is showing you one lens with the aberration and we're then talking about the cornea and the crystal lens, the offsetting that. Off-axis aberrations, well, you have to look at someone to see them. You gotta look directly at it. You gotta put them on axis. So uh, we don't rely on peripheral vision. Well, we, if someone has a hand comes up, someone's gonna, you know, you're gonna hit something then, you know, or you're gonna walk into a wall or you're gonna walk into something, but really you have to look directly at it to see it clearly. Also a little uh, light pipe here. Uh, there are cones, a light pipe, total internal reflection, so you have to have a, an angle here that's uh, closer to, uh, you know, coming straight in, like along, along the axis. Okay, that takes care of that. And then we now go to uh, L. Let's see what L's got for us in L. Okay, a little interdisciplinary uh, stuff here. We can skip over that philosophy here of deriving things. Uh, this is a review of uh, tri trigonometry. You got your basic formula, of course, we, that one we would know before taking our class. Know that one. So all this looks uh, pretty fast. I think here, the main thing here is that your, 
your problems that have uh, equilibrium uh, for small oscillations, you get the uh, harmonic oscillator. And that's your Hooke's law. F is equal to minus kx. Where is that thing? Uh, here it is. F is minus kx. And then the potential energy is one half kx squared. A little Taylor series expansion there. Okay, that's uh, you know, that's basic calculus stuff. You should should remember that. I take this opportunity to master, you know, this uh, power series, which comes about in physics a lot, like when you expand the sines and cosines. Uh, this is showing you how to solve for the harmonic oscillator problem. This is a very, very nice review of basic physics, that F equals MA, that's your acceleration. So I would say this is good to review. Comes up later, too, with the Rayleigh scattering later in the course. So that's good stuff. Uh, here's the solution uh, for the general student, just following the motion. And then this is a review of a lot of introductory physics stuff. You know, to, so this is, this is a nice chapter. It reviews a lot of basic stuff. And this is uh, reviewing... You know, this is showing you your pulse moving to the right by displacement, like you learn in, in trigonometry how to shift sines and cosines. So that's good. And then when you put the D is V times T, you have the wave, the K, the wave number. All this good stuff is a review and helps uh, you master your earlier f introductory physics course, say. So that's all good stuff, see, all these definitions. So, uh, so these were seen in introductory physics, so it's kind of review. I wanted to be complete in this class, so I reviewed all those for you. So hopefully this is a more relaxing, you know, review chapter, kind of like the aberrations chapter, that in contrast to some of the others that have the more heavy math. So here is, you know, again, your cosines and sines uh, expansion and the famous Euler result, this exponential, and this result here. See, yeah, this definitely needs to be memorized. You would definitely want to know that, not only for this course, but for like practically every course in engineering and physics that you come across. This is very important. Uh, that's the cute uh, relationship that we had talked about, the gingerbread house. And then you could use the power, see, of these things. So use that, you know how to use that. And here, I guess what I'm shooting for uh, is I, I want you to see that you want to make sure you know what I'm really interested in getting at here, a core, a core thing to memorize are these. You definitely want to memorize these, you know, cosine, sine, in terms of exponentials. This is very important, very important. That's more important, how to use this. Like in the homework problem I gave you to prove an identity, to use these, to use the Euler relations. You want to know how to do that. And that's more important than the details uh, up in here for this particular problem. But what should you know in general? Well, you want to know in general that when you have a complex number, you want the Z, you want to use, that. you want to know this, Z star, and Z, and then to get to get the say like the modulus or like what's considered like the magnitude or the absolute magnitude of a complex number, you take Z times Z star. So you do want to know that. And then when we use something like the phaser, uh, that may kick in. So for this, this derivation, I think you want to know uh, how to find uh, a different optical path length. See, this is this optical path length here it has an extra optical path length. So you want to be able to relate that. There's a whole problem even later it deals with that. It's like KX or KZ. So this is like your X or your Z. And if you then have K times X, you got this. So that's that's important to know to know how to relate that. So that that little distance d sine theta, then the k kicks in, say the two pi over lambda, and here is the k times that delta. So like that three step process. First step we said what is the distance? 
like that's your z or your x so yeah, that was d that was d sine theta so we got the d sine theta and then we bring in this k thing and say well k z is going to be your angle so your k times your delta and that's where your k is your two pi relano very very important basic stuff to know there and remember your amplitude square gets you your intensity always want to remember that Okay, so here, uh, yeah, we're setting something up and then doing the square. So this is, this is, yeah, this is applying the principle, you know, where there's one, say, uh, light wave and then another one has a different phase because it had to go a little extra distance. So this is crank, it just cranks itself out. So I, uh, you can set these up and crank these out. Uh, this is not, um, not there's not memorization here it's, it's a process but you do want to memorize these two cosine and sine know those for the beats i would say for the beats if you have two uh things close together uh they're gonna you're gonna have an average uh w wave uh, length there average frequency pretty much and then it's going to pulsate and the pulsations are going to be at the difference. So I think the way you could remember this, why I tell my students in my introductory class, when you have two tones that are real close to each other, or two waves, then what happens is you, you get the average wave, you get the average, but it's going to pulsate at the difference. So if you have, say, a 400 hertz wave and a 400, uh, 404, it, you would get you would hear 402 the average and it would pulse at the difference four per second so if you remember that you're all set you, you got the beats down you got all this stuff down uh, all these deltas and stuff just remember that rule you hear the average and it pulsates at the difference yeah and then all this stuff yeah th this stuff was just plugging in and showing that these things were the, were uh, the same so this is, uh, if you look this over, you'll see there's nothing really tricky there. That's just some basic algebra. Uh, the group velocity, it's good to memorize the two, the two formulas that the, the phase velocity is omega over k, and the group one is the derivative. So that's, it's good to know that, and memorize, of course, your index of refraction formula. Uh, so then you can crank away and do stuff. Okay, so here, uh, the trap, I don't think we need to worry about the trap. We're probably not going to come we're worry, come in meeting the trap, uh, but that's a paper Perkins and I wrote. And then here we are going to now, let's see, M. All right, M, let's do M. So M is the wave equation. Uh, this, uh, you know, picking partial derivatives in the chain rule, this is not a bad, a bad thing. Uh, so I would know how to, you know, how to work your way around that. That's good. Then take the second derivative and get the wave equation. Nice. Gauss's law. Well, let's see. What do we need here? This, this is a little tricky because overlaps with the e m course. Uh, definitely know your definition of a patch of area needs to have something that's normal to that little DA. You do want to know that definition and know what this means and how to calculate it. So it's really a review of 222, your physics class. They did all this in that class, so uh, and we do need it. So I would say uh, you should study this, yeah, review this. And this is also a review of your earlier class, so it's always good to uh, master these basic concepts. So I would read through this. This is, again, a review of the earlier course. This is kind of a review class here. So for, for a lot, I mean, a lot of stuff, so I'll review. So, you know, read over this stuff. All right, this is good to go over. And then we have the uh, Maxwell equations see here it's nice to know how to apply this rule since that's a basic thing that was done in the earlier course to get this result and here i would just kind of read over this to understand where this comes from and see there are the maxwell equations so let's see what else uh, this stuff this is a derivation i would say here 
you want to know how to do one of these things, basically going around here, uh, this is a closed uh, loop, so you're basically taking the uh, vector that's lined up with that line and multiplying that out. So it's good to know this process. Yeah, this process, how to do these. Uh, okay, gets you the wave equation. All right, and then the famous formula with the C when you put in the speed of light, you get that very good. Uh, measuring the speed of light, just know generally, historically, eight sides rotating rapidly and uh, another mirror miles away. Uh, I wouldn't memorize the details, but you should know the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay, so here, uh, yeah, this is knowing that the E and V fields are perpendicular to each other. That's good to know. Uh, transverse wave. You should be able to write down these two equations down below. All right. And know the concept of the wave. The spectrum, yeah, nice to know the spectrum that you have here. Uh, if you go from the far left to the far right, this is increasing wavelength. Gamma rays, X-rays, UV, visible, infrared, microwave, and radio. It's nice to know that. Yeah, here's a nice little simple breakdown. And then we had a professor of chemistry that talked about the spectrum. So uh, nice uh, to see what the colleagues and colleagues are doing at other universities in chemistry and very nice. Nice work. All right. So I think that we're finished with that one. And that brings us to the last one. Okay. Got a little philosophy here at the beginning, which we can uh, skip over. And then the plane wave model. See, this is the same thing we just saw. Say so that we should know these. And remember that, you know, V, your speed is omega over K. You do want to memorize that. Actually, this E naught and V one is kind of easy to remember because the E one is more powerful in terms of the order of magnitude because when we write down equations, we don't worry about the B field. When you have an oscillator, for example, an electron is oscillating, it's the, when the wave comes in, it makes the electron move. We don't worry about the magnetic force because the magnetic force is suppressed. If you have your right down B naught, it would be E naught divided by C. But see, that's basic formula there. V is uh, omega over K, C is omega over K. All right, so this here looks like notation uh, review. This is another review. So there's a lot of review in this course. I do that intentionally because I want you to master concepts from other courses and used in a lot of physics. So take this as an opportunity. I mean, look at it this way, that a lot of the study for this exam, there are, you know, chunks of reviews. Uh, so there you go. The review again, that the amplitude squared or you take the uh, ZZ star, if you have, you know, imaginary. And uh, so you got all this good stuff. The, well, you know this formula, and you know this, you know these formulas already. You know this already, so you could derive this. So you could always arrive at this if the magnetic properties are not there. You have the vacuum magnetic constant, and you could always derive that. Here, you should just know the boundary conditions, like know what they are. That it means that the parallel components here are going to be, or I guess that they use the word tangent here more because they're using parallel for another, you know, polarization. So the tangential uh, components are going to be matched. So when you know that, you're not going to be asked to derive all this stuff. You're not going to be asked to derive that. So you can kind of skim over that. You can skim over these derivations. We're not going to derive all this stuff. So there's your law of reflection. Now, you need to memorize your law of reflection, of course. You already have seen that in another course. You've already seen the Snell's law. You need to memorize these because you can get a problem on an exam where you're not told to use the angle of reflection. You're not told to use the uh, Snell's law, but it's assumed that these are in your bag of tricks and your toolbox, and you could pull those right out 
and you could use them as necessary, just like you can sketch in little triangles like you do in trigonometry to like find sines and cosines. So just remember, these are in your toolbox and they do show up uh, as you do need them when you're doing problems and uh, have them at the tip of your fingers. Angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence and n1 sine theta 1 is n2 sine theta 2 where you have the interface, you have two materials, two, two media. Uh, for now equations, you're not going to have to derive these things. They take too long, so this is good news here. We're going to skip over this, and the good news is you're going to be given these things. In other words, on an exam, you would be given the R and the T and then know how to use them, so that's the good news. We can go right to the end of the chapter and skip over to the summary. Yes, here. So you would be given the stuff on an exam and asked to then manipulate and do stuff. So good news, that's this chapter, which is very deep. Uh, most of the details you're not gonna have to worry about. It's gonna be the application, say. Uh, and here is an example of an application here, you know, where you're setting the angle to be zero, normal incidence. So this is uh, good news since uh, here all this detailed stuff to derive the Fresnel equations or you're not going to need to even look over. You don't need to really worry about that. So we're looking at the summary equations at the end of the chapter. Uh, here they are. And you did you know, two of these for homework, but you don't have to memorize them. So this would be given and you didn't work with it. So that looks like we have done the review. Uh, and we've done it within an hour. And there is the, uh, the structure of this exam is similar to the other one. You're going to have uh, multiple choice. There'll be 10 of them, uh, three points each. And then you'll have uh, four other questions that involve like doing calculations and things. So I believe that's the structure. I think there's like uh, maybe a 20 point, 20 point or 15, 15. I don't remember exactly the, the numbers, but we're going to be looking at that kind of format. All right. Good luck.